perhaps uh, having a session like this for the benefit of everyone involved. Now, for a number of years, while we had been engaged in doing a little bit in promoting the knowledge of the deen on the footing of the Salaf al-Salihin, we had been experiencing all kinds of hardships and problems. And there had been obstacles raised from both within and outside. And one of the problems we had been experiencing was particularly against a group of committed, apparently sincere brothers and sisters who have great ardent zeal for the establishment of the Sharia to make the affairs of the Muslims strong and to see the defeat of the enemies of Allah. So on the face of it, we were very impressed. And at one time, we had actually attempted to have very close meetings with this particular group to investigate possibilities of working together as one jama'ah, one group of active brothers and sisters. The jama'ah, as you well know by now, is al hizb al tahrir Now, we have had dealings with them for the past six, seven years. And at all levels, we have experienced relationships with them. We had had meetings with the Amir at that time, and of course, we have had encounters with someone who have, whom we can classify as a very new beginner who has been influenced by the ideas of al hizb al-Tahrir. So at all levels, alhamdulillah. This session is not intended to be a hate session or a pouring out of grudge session or to have a bash at each other. This session is something required as a necessity so we can understand ourselves better, our situation and try and investigate why is it that we experience, particularly from this group, hardships against our work. We'd like to understand that the hardships that we have been experiencing are as a result of the foundation upon which they are based, but perhaps they are not really based upon the correct foundation. We are talking about Muslims. This program is really for the benefit of ourselves and them. We haven't come to seek vengeance, there is no benefit in that. Because at the end of the day, we, as we mentioned on the first, very first night, we are all Muslims. So we are talking about Muslims to Muslims, as Muslims. So this is very important to understand, very important to bear in mind. And if brothers and sisters have been coming to our circles, study circles, and meetings and lectures, whether in a, in a, in a formal way, in a public institution, or in a house in an informal way, they would surely know if their objective that we have been at all this time promoting the idea of brotherhood and that we have never actually promoted the idea that we are dealing with a group of people who are outside the fold of Islam or who are our enemies or whom we have to backstab. But if that they are our brothers and then we feel they are deviated. We want to protect ourselves from the errors which are publicly promoted and we want to educate them as well by the grace of Allah. To that end, we have discussed with the various shaykhs that you see on the platform today. And Alhamdulillah, they have agreed to throw some light upon the nature of the problem by talking about the reality of al hizb al-Tahrir from the point of view of their foundation, their creed, their methodology, and so on. Alhamdulillah, it is an open fact, very, very well known, it's clear, throughout the entire country that there is some type of competition or rivalry between these two groups. Whether in reality or otherwise, that is what is perceived by the people. Even though we may not feel it, of course the public at large know this, because it is perceived at all levels, in schools, in fifth form, sixth form colleges, and in universities, and even at private, in homes. Now, a lot of stuff has come to our knowledge from the speeches and writings of al hizb al-Tahrir with which we disagree. It's not as if we hadn't tried to have conversations and discussions with them, we have. But when errors become established and we find a degeneration in the people being called towards the worship of Allah and we find calculated, designed input to the public to make them swerve away from the straight path and adopt a hard-hearted attitude toward the way of the best of generations, when we find, for example, designed, calculated statements to undermine and cut off the roots of our education, the scholars. When we find, for example, falsehood promoted 
in the name of uh, the reasoning of the deen, when we find these things, we feel concerned. And it is our duty as part of the effort of enjoining goodness, forbidding evil, of con conveying the truth, that we bring to light to these type of problems to warn, not to create hate, not to make us fight each other, but to warn. And inshallah, at the end of, after, this pro, after the, the sheikh has spoken, the platform will be open for you to clarify any issues discussed or raised and to seek explanations of any statements made and to demand proof and justifications. So please listen carefully. We have no time limit. As and, as, as and when the scholars feel that they want to stop and go, they will stop and go. It is totally informal. Brothers and sisters would be allowed to ask questions from the floor, but it will be controlled, obviously, for the sake of discipline. We will start with the great scholar, uh, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Ismail, Hafadahullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-Musaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. ما من شك أن هناك يعني أهدافا مشتركة بين شتى الاتجاهات والجماعات الإسلامية وما من أحد يخالف في أهمية مثل هذه الأهداف الأساسية إخواننا في حزب التحرير لهم مجال قد تخصصوا فيه وأيضا أجادوا في كثير من المواضع لكنهم لو أنهم يعني اختصوا بالجانب السياسي أو التثقيف السياسي والفكري باعتبار أن هذه جزئية من جزئيات الدعوة وأعطوها جهدهم إذا لا حرج في ذلك أما أن يتحول موضوع الاهتمام بالجانب التثقيف السياسي بحيث يكون هو المحور والقطف الذي ندور حوله ثم بعد ذلك نحاول أن ننتقد الذين يكملون هذا النقص وبالذات إذا كان النقص في أمور أساسية كقضايا التوحيد والعقيدة هنا نحن نحتاج إلى مثل هذه الوقفة لأن لأنه إذا تعددت الجماعات الإسلامية كل يقدم هدفا معينا يتخصص فيه الأمر هنا يكون لا بأس به أما إذا كان واحد ينظر الإسلام فقط بعين واحدة أو من زاوية واحدة فقط ويرى أن هذا هو كل الإسلام وأن كل من خالفه إما متهم في نيته وإما كذا أو كذا فيعني مثل هذا يستوجب أن نقف مع مثل هذه الوقفة حتى نضع الأمور في نصابها ونزنها بميزانها الصحيح الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد شيخ محمد إسماعيل صار راح by saying no doubt that all the various Islamic uh, movements in our day have a number of common aims and common goals and these common aims and common goals which can be found throughout the different Islamic uh, movements are very important. And our brothers in Hizb al-Tahrir have worked towards one aim, and that is uh, educating the Muslims, giving them political awareness, and they've done a good job in many aspects concerning that. However, the problem has occurred when they have taken this one aim in this one direction and have made it the whole religion, and have also gone further by stopping education in other areas which are essential and indeed more important than just mere political education. When this occurs, when Muslims start taking only one direction of the religion or one aspect of the religion and blow it out of proportion, preventing other people to explain the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in its completeness, it then becomes required upon those who have knowledge to stand forth and explain the matter as it surely, as it surely must be and for them to stand forth and place things in their proper place. And it is from this perspective that we are uh, starting this talk. فيما يتعلق بمناقشة هذا الموضوع الذي نتكلم فيه، نبدأ بأن نبين أننا أن تلاحظوا أن هذا الذي نتكلم فيه اليوم إن شاء الله عبارة عن مناقشات علمية في قضايا محددة. هناك خلاف بين مع إخواننا في حزب التحرير. هذه أشياء معلمة وظاهرة وليست يعني مكتومة أو خفية أيضا نحن لا نحاسب الناس على نياتهم لكننا نحاسبهم على ما يظهرون ونتخذ المواقف حسب ما يظهرون ونبدأ كلامنا ببداية بداية يعني عادية وهي أن نذكر الحسنات التي قد أجد فيها حزب التحرير من باب الإنصاف فنحن نشكر لحزب التحرير أولا بواقفه في التصدي للأفكار 
الإلحادية والمذاهب المادية سواء يعني شيوعية أو رأس مالية أو وجودية دفاعا عن الإسلام في هذا المجال. ثانيا أيضا متابعة الحزب بلا شك متابعة ملحوظة للأحداث التي تجري على مسرح الحياة وإيجاد موقف يعني إزائها جميعا أيضا والتحذير من بعض الأفكار أو بعض الأخطار قد يكون أحيانا مبنيا على التخمين وقد يصيب أحيانا في كثير من هذه الأمور لكننا مع ذلك ننتقد حزب تحرير الانتقادا أساسيا لكونه قد اشتغل بالتثقيف السياسي على حساب قضايا أهم وأشد خطورة فيما يتعلق بالأمة المسلمة ولبنات المجتمع الإسلامي المنشود The other issue which we must keep in mind is that the discussion which we have today is going to be a discussion based in knowledge, rooted in knowledge. And we're going to discuss not matters which are hidden and unknown, but rather matters which are openly known, matters which Hizb al-Tahrir openly declare and call to and say openly, not hiding in, whatever, in any manner, that these are their beliefs or their principles. However, uh, we should also remember that in no way are we discussing the people's intentions. For people's intentions are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All we are discussing from what they openly profess and they openly claim as their beliefs and as their tenets and as their principles. And I'd like to start off by mentioning some of their good qualities, or we mentioning some of their good qualities. We are very thankful to his Tahir for their work in warning the Ummah concerning certain ideologies, foreign ideologies, which are rooted amongst the disbelievers, like, for example, communism, uh, nationalism, capitalism, uh, existentialism, and other of these different uh, ideologies which have influenced the Ummah, and they have stood forward trying to refute uh, the erroneous doctrines and beliefs. And at the same time, we are thankful for them for their effort in trying to follow the different events which occur in the Islamic world, and informing the Muslims as a whole about exactly what's going on uh, in a worldwide context in the Islamic world. Although sometimes while they attempt to explain the reasons why, they are sometimes correct and sometimes they are incorrect. However, in general, their desire to uh, educate the Muslims and a whole concerning what's going on in the Islamic world, obviously. Oh, no. I'm just going to wait for a moment just so the sound reaches the sisters. One second, finish. لا بالعكس أنا مسؤول جداً لا عمل أنا قلت لك بدأ لا 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 بالعكس أنا مسؤول جداً بذاك لا تقول الله يا خلاص أنت لفن كبير يا بالفضل آه والله يا كبير القدر وكبير العلم وكبير الفضل يا والله تعرف أنا لا أستبعد تكون متعمد شغل الصوت نعم. نعم. ها؟ أنا أشعر أنا أحب في كأس ما يبدو لي ها؟ يبدو لي ها؟ يبدو لي ها؟ 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 الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد. Uh, repeating again what Sheikh Mohammed Ismail started off saying in this last uh, translation section. We have to understand that our discussion concerning his Tahrir is concerning specific issues which they themselves propagate and call to and openly declare as being part of their tenets, as being part of their beliefs, as being part of their principles. And in no way are we discussing the people's intentions, because the intentions of the people of any Muslim lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we do discuss, and what we are judging and critical of, is concerning what they openly manifest and openly declare as being their beliefs or their tenets or their principles. And with this in mind, we need to also, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered for us to be just, even with those we might have differences with, that it's important for us to mention some of the good qualities and some of the benefits which his Tahrir has brought to our Ummah. Even though we are now discussing our differences with them, we're still going to mention some of their good qualities. 
among which is that we are thankful to them in the sense that they have, have uh, stood up and printed books and pamphlets in refuting certain ideologies, certain doctrines, certain creeds, which can be found amongst the disbelievers. Among which is like, for instance, communism, capitalism, uh, nationalism in its various forms, existentialism, and so forth. They have written and tried to explain to the Ummah the dangers of these beliefs and the dangerous effects they leave amongst the Muslims as a whole. We're also thankful for them for their closely following the events and closely watching what occurs in the Islamic world and trying to inform the Muslims as, exact, the Muslims as, a, whole, as a whole to what is exactly occurring uh, in the Islamic world. Although sometimes when they try to uh, explain why these different events are happening, sometimes they're correct in their explanation as to the reasons why these events are happening, and sometimes they are incorrect. But however, in general, we are thankful for them because they have tried to make us more informed of what's going on in the Islamic world. So these are among the various uh, benefits which they have given, and we are thankful to them in this. أيضا مما ينبغي أن ننبه إليه أن التفريق بين الوسيلة وبين الغاية بين الوسيلة وبين الهدف فالغاية مخدومة والوسيلة خادمة الغاية التي بعث الله سبحانه وتعالى بها الرسل وخلق من أجلها الخلق ويعني أنزل الكتب ويعني دعا كانت مفتاح دعوة جميع الرسل هي اعبدوا الله ما لكم من إله غيره فغاية الغيات وأصل الأصول في دين الإسلام هو ومفتاح هذه الدعوة التي افتتح بها جميع الأنبياء دعوتهم هي تعبيد الناس لربهم تعبيد الناس لربهم سبحانه وتعالى ودعوتهم إلى توحيده عز وجل لا شريك له نحن نلاحظ في مناهج حزب التحرير أن الاهتمام مثلا أن هناك إهمالا أو يعني عدم فهم لهذه الغاية هذه الغاية ربما نعجز في بعض الأوقات عن أن نقيم الدولة الإسلامية هل ينتهي كل شيء هل نبقى فارغين نندب حظنا ونبكي أحوالنا أم أن هناك غاية إذا عجزنا عن هذا فهناك أمور يعني لابد أن تكون هي الهدف الأساسي والرئيسي لدعوتنا نكرر قبل أن نستطرد ليس نحن لا ننتقد حزب التحريم أجل اهتمامه بالسياسة وبالتسقيق الفكري لكننا ننتقد عليه الاهتمام بها على حساب ما هو أهم منها والإعراض عن الغاية العظمى لدعوة الرسل وهي تعبيد الناس لربهم تصحيح العقائد و يعني تعديل السلوك امتثالا لقول الله تبارك وتعالى إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم Now what we should understand is that our criticism of Hizb al-Tahrir is basically rooted in the fact that they have over uh, emphasize or over stress political education leaving out that which is more important for the Muslim to know and that is because they have failed to distinguish between the difference uh, the difference between the means and the aim the means which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given for us to establish the aims and the aims and in of, the, and of themselves and to make uh, be further uh, clear we all know or we all should know that the aim of our existence here on earth, the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us, and the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down the scriptures and sent the messengers and prophets to mankind, and the issue upon which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge mankind on the day of judgment is the issue of tawheed, or worshipping Allah alone and not ascribing to him partners, whether in his attributes or whether in his worship. Unfortunately, what we find is that those who adhere or the, in the... Uh, program or methodology of his Tahrir that due to their overemphasis and their extremism in having political education they fail to stress this issue enough amongst their followers and therefore often they do not or they forget they seem to forget this very important aim which their existence here on earth is to achieve and that is to worship Allah alone uh, for instance uh, as an example if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that we are not able, we are not capable, and this is the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we are unable, are, in, are incapable of establishing the Islamic Khilafah. Does that mean that we forget the aim to which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for, in the sense that we forsake worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He has wanted, and, that, and, and forsake uh, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He has ordered? Of course not. And so here is what we should understand. That our criticism of Hizb al-Tahrir is not because they have entered in 
to the realm of political education, as some people might assume falsely. But our criticism of them lies in the fact that they have entered into this realm forgetting the importance and the aim for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed us and them on the earth. And that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, not ascribing any partners to Him. بالنسبة لسلم الأولويات في برامج حزب التحرير يتصدر قمة هذا السلم الهدف الأساسي وهو تكلم الحكم عن طريق الأمة تكلم الحكم عن طريق الأمة وعن طريق نشر التثقيف الجماعي والفكري والسياسي عن طريق المجالس النيابية والنشاط الإعلامي الواسع ومخاطبة الجهات الرسمية والاتصال بالسياسيين وكل ما أمكن من قطاعات الأمة ثم الوسيلة الأخرى التالية وهي المباشرة وهي وسيلة يعني الجهاد يقفز الحزب فوق سلم الأوليات قفزة هائلة ويهمل مرحلة من أخطر المراحل في بناء أي دعوة وهي مرحلة التكوين نعم تريدوا تقولون جهاد تقولون التمكين وإقامة الخلافة لكن لا تنسوا أن الجهاد والدولة كلاهما خادم لهدف الأساسي وهو يعني تعبيد الناس لربهم سبحانه وتعالى ف يعني يفتقد الحزب في هذا المجال مرحلة التكوين والتربية على العبادة على العقيدة يعني السديدة هذا الهدف الذي تفرغ له النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في مكة ثلاثة عشرة سنة كاملة في مرحلة التكوين والبناء لبناء هذا يعني المجتمع الجديد فهذا من أكبر ما يؤخذ على الجهاد على على يعني أولوياتهم الجهاد في حد ذاته الجهاد ما هو وسيلة وسيلة لماذا وسيلة للتمكين لنشر مفهوم صحيح للإسلام يعني الجهاد خادم للهدف الأعظم الهدف الأعظم هو تعبيد الناس لربهم الله ابتعثنا لنخرج العباد من عبادة العباد إلى عبادة رب العباد ومن جور الأديان إلى عدل الإسلام ومن ضيق الدنيا إلى سعة الدنيا والآخرة كما قال ذبعي ابن عامر رضي الله تعالى عنه لرستم قائد الفرس قبل من قعت القادسية واضح فالجهاد هو عبارة عن وسيلة لنشر الدعوة نشر المفهوم الصحيح للإسلام الدعوة الإسلامية ليس المقصود مجرد التمكين والقوة لكن المقصود أنها تقوم من أجل حراسة الدين وسياسة الدنيا بالدين فإذا لم يكن عندما عندنا الفهم الصحيح الشامل للإسلام ففي سبيل ماذا نجاهد وماذا نتوقع إذا وقع لنا بالفعل هذا التمكين أي فكر وأي يعني منهج وأي فهم سوف ننشره في الناس عن طريق الجهاد عن طريق دولة الخلافة إذا هذا قلب لسلم الأولويات وهذا عكس ترتيب مراحل دعوة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الذي بدأ أولا بإعلام الناس ودعوتهم وتوضيح مفاهيم وتعليم الإسلام لهم ثم بعد ذلك الذين يستجبون يأخذهم يربيهم ويعلمهم على هذه التعليم ثم بعد ذلك ترد من تأتي مرحلة مواجهة أعداء هذا المنج حزب التحرير يقفز فورا إلى أن يجعل الأصل الأصيل والهدف الأساسي هو إقامة الدولة وينبغي أن ننشغل بأي شيء آخر حتى تقوم الدولة فيعني فهذا قلب لترتيب الطبيع الذي سلكه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في التمكين لهذا الدين Now when we just said that our criticism our main criticism of them is not the fact that they have entered into politics but the fact that they have gone extreme in this matter to so much to this extent that they have forgotten the aim in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for and that is of course to worship Him alone not ascribing any partners to Him and this therefore they have forgotten the actual sunnah or the actual way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth with, uh, with mankind for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a very clear verse in Surah Ra'ad that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never change a people, the state of a people until they change that which is in themselves meaning until they change their beliefs their attitude, their morals, and their worship. And thereby we may say that in the program or the methodology of Hizb tahrir they have immediately jumped to the conclusion and they have forgotten the most essential laying the foundation and they have also have reversed and made the aim uh, forgotten and have made a means the means of the aim. And how does that maybe explain? They immediately try to jump to the issue of establishing the Khilafah and waging jihad against the disbelievers. Forgetting in that it's before they actually are able to achieve this aim properly, they need to first raise Muslims upon the correct belief, upon the correct faith. As the Prophet Muhammad did, while he was in Mecca for 13 years, 
teaching the people, calling them to the correct faith, and educating and raising a whole generation upon this correct faith. So that therefore they were then able to establish an Islamic state thereafter and to face the disbelievers. That's the first issue. The second issue is that they seem to forget that the Islamic state itself and the establishment of the Khilafah itself and jihad itself are only means to serve the aim. And they, keep, they seem to forget that the aim is, of course, to worship Allah alone. Making these means of establishing the Khilafah and these means of waging jihad against the disbelievers aimed in and of themselves and forgetting that they have only been come, they have only been made they have all, only come in the Sharia to be means to serve the aim which is to worship Allah alone which is the reason of our existence and the message of all the prophets from Noah to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and therefore they have changed and they have reversed the message of the Prophet Sallallahu where as we know that one of the Prophet Sallallahu companions Rabi ibn Amr when addressing the Persian uh, king or the Persian commander Rustam just prior to the battle of Qadisiyah said we have come to take the people <clears throat> out from the worship of one another to the worship of Allah alone and from the strictness or from the, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the difficulty and the strictness on the hardship of this world to the vastness of this world and the hereafter so they have completely forgotten this methodology the Prophet ﷺ has made by making a means and aims into and of itself and by trying to immediately get to this aim which in itself is a means, without having the first degree of educating the people and raising the people and teaching the people and laying a foundation on true faith to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore we must ask the question that if, let us imagine that they did actually achieve their aims, although it is most likely impossible, but had they achieved their aims, what would they end up then preaching to the people? Since they have not themselves spent the time to educate themselves on the correct faith, that if they did establish a khilafah, or if they did themselves try to engage in jihad, what type of jihad would it be? And what type of khilafah would it be? Would it be a jihad and a khilafah which tries to uh, make the word of Allah the highest and achieve the worship of Allah alone? Or would it be a khilafah and a jihad which we would not be able to recognize the truthfulness in it, but rather it would be a mixture of correct and incorrect concepts? اعتبر الحزب الفكر هو الوسيلة الأساسية لبناء الشخصية المسلمة ويعني أدى حصر مجال العمل الإسلامي التربوي وتكوين الشخصية ودعوة الأمة في العقل وحده إلى يعني بعض الجفاف الروحي وانتشار الجدل والمنحة الفلسفي في حين أن هذا لا يثمر فالمستشرقون ينفقون سنوات كثيرة ويدرسون الإسلام دراسة نظرية دون أن يحدث ذلك تغييرا في الواقع وكذلك الفلاسفة حين أعمال العقل في هذه الأشياء وما وصلوا إلى إلى يعني شيء يقول حزب التحرير إن تسلم زمام الحكم يكون عن طريق نشر الوعي الفكري والسياسي ثم يعني للجمال هذا يؤدي إلى صراع فكري الصراع الفكري يؤدي إلى انقلاب فكري الانقلاب الفكري تلقائيا يتحول إلى انقلاب سياسي وتسلم ل الحكم كما عبر تماما بعض الشيوخ قال انهم يتصورون ان سوف تنزل الدولة الاسلامية عليهم فانها المائدة في طبق من السماء ويفتحون الطبق ويجدون طبقة جاهزة فيتناولونها كلا هذا قبض فوق يعني الاولويات وقفز فوق الترتيب الذي سلكه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وبالذات تجاوز مرحلة التربية والتكوين الخلقي والعبادي والروحي والعلمي حتى يعرف الإنسان في سبيل ماذا يجاهد ما هو هذا المبدأ الذي يجاهد من أجله نأخذ أيضا على الحزب عدم النشاط في الدعوة إلى الأمور يعني العبادية بحرارة بالحرارة المطلوبة كالصلاة كالزكاة كغير ذلك من أمور الالتزام بشعائر الدين بل الذي تعودنا الإهمال مثل هذه يعني الأشياء وزعم أن هذه من خصوصيات الدولة الإسلامية بعد قيامها ونسأنقل يعني عبارة يقول الحزب في مفاهيمه يقول ان الفرق الفرق بين الدعوة التي تحملها جماعة في امة اسلامية وبين الدعوة التي تحملها الدولة اسلامية هو ان الدعوة التي تحملها الدولة الاسلامية تتمثل فيها الناحية العملية فيتطبق الاسلام في الداخل تطبيقا كاملا واما الدعوة التي تحملها جماعة او كتلة اللي هو الحزب قبل ان يمكن فهي اعمال تتعلق بالفكر ولا تتعلق بالقيام باعمال اخرى فقط هي قضية فكرية وعمل تعلقوا بالفكر يقول بعض يعني احد منظري الحزب يقول 
ولهذا كان لا شأن للكتلة الإسلامية بالنواحي العملية وتعتبر القيام بأي عمل من الأعمال عملا ملهيا ومخدرا ومعوقا للدعوة الاهتمام بالأمور العملية كل ما عدا السياسة والتثقيف الفكري مخدر وملهي ومعوق للدعوة فيعني هل يمكن أن يتصوروا يعني صحة مثل هذا الكلام وأن مثل هذا البناء يعني يمكن أن يبنى عليه بناء صحيح لتمكين المسلمين كيف والله سبحانه وتعالى يعني يجعل التمكين هو مكافأة للمسلمين على التزامهم بطاعة ربهم تبارك وتعالى One of the issues which we also are critical concerning his Tahrir with is the fact that they stress that it's only an ideological message that they have. And therefore we find them basically engaging in argumentation and we do not find a noticeable change in their attitudes and their behaviors and their dispositions, even though they might spend a certain amount of time with the Hizb. And this is much like how the Orientalists and the philosophers are, who spend many years studying Islam, but yet they are not affected and there is no real spiritual change amongst them afterwards. They believe that, and we also find as a result of this concept, that they do, we do not find them actually calling to the various acts of worship, like prayer, zakah, and so forth, with the enthusiasm which is needed. And this is based upon a, an idea they have, a concept, that this group, prior to the establishment of the Islamic State, should only deal with ideological matters. For they believe that if they spread these ideological matters in society, a certain political awareness will occur. And this political awareness will lead to an ideological struggle, which will then result in a change in society. As some scholars have described, they imagine as if the Islamic State would just fall out of the sky, ready for them to take over. And this, of course, is far from the truth. But rather, uh, still, and argumentation in itself will not ever establish what they are calling to. And as a result, they also describe that those people who are concerned with actually the various acts of worship as drugging themselves and making it almost like an opium in which they delude themselves and forget that which is more important, which is their ideological uh, declarations and so forth. And how could this be the way of the prophets of Allah? How could this be what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends from his creation that we consider the various acts of worship to be something relegated to after the Islamic State is established. And that prior to that, for us to spend any time and stress at all concerning these things, it is a form of drugging ourselves and a form of delusion and a form of intoxication, which we have intoxicated ourselves with leading, uh, leaving us, leaving from that which is more important. ونحن إذا يعني تأملنا الخطوط الحراف عن أهل السنة والجماعة عن طريق أهل البدع والفرق الضلة نلاحظ أن أغلب هذه الفرق قد اتخذوا مع أهل السنة على حقيقة معينة وهي اعتبار أن التوحيد أصل الأصول في دين الله عز وجل حتى المعتزلة حتى غيره من الفرق اتفقوا جميعا على أهمية التوحيد وأن له الأولوية الخصوة تصحيح العقيدة وتغيير العقيدة وإن اكتلفوا بعد ذلك في فهم هذه العقيدة لكن إلى أن جاء حزب التحرير وأحتبه تشبه في ذلك بالشيعة وعظم من شأن الإمامة وبالغ والخلافة وبالغ في تعظيمها إلى الحد الذي حصل يعني أن كان ذلك على حساب هذه الأولويات تعودنا يعني على أن نستمع انتقادات من إخواننا في حزب التحرير فيما يتعلق بأن الدعوة السلفية تهتم بأمور تافهة ودونية ألا وهي أمور العبادات وأمور العلم الشرعي وأمور التوحيد وكذا وكذا من الأمور التي يصفونها بأنها قشور أو خضايا تؤجل إلى أن تقوم يعني الدولة الإسلامية نحن نقول إن أصل الأصول في ذي الله عز وجل هو التوحيد وليس الإمامة الإمامة من الدين الخلافة من الدين لكنها ليست هي أصل الأصول في هذا الدين وردا على هذا الانتقاد الذي يتكرر لأن هذا في الحقيقة يحدث شبها كثيرا عند كثير من إخواننا وهو هذه الانتقادات الله سبحانه وتعالى يقول يا أيها الذين آمنوا دخلوا في السلم كافة هذه آية ليست حديث أحد يا أيها الذين آمنوا ادخلوا في السلم كافة ما معنى كيف فسرها العلماء فسرها العلماء ادخلوا في السلم كافة أي ادخلوا في شعب الإيمان كلها ولا تخلوا بشيء من أحكامه التزموا بجميع الإسلام وبأحكام الإسلام حتى يستوعب ذلك ظاهركم وباطنكم ثم نسألهم يعني الأشياء التي تعتبرونها أشياء دونية 
وان امور السياسه اهم منها هذه الاشياء كالصلاه والزكاه وغير ذلك من يعني العبادات هي تدخل في دائره الواجب ام لا تدخل ما تعريف الواجب الواجب الذي طلب طلبا لازما بحيث يثاب فعله ويؤثم ويعاقب يعني تاركه اليس قد قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تنقضن عور الاسلام عروه عروه فكل ما انتقضت عروه تشبث الناس بالتي تليها فاولهن نقضا فاولهن نقضا الحكم واخرهن الصلاه فهكذا ترون كيف ان يعني النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عدى الامرين كلاهما من عرى يعني الاسلام والله سبحانه وتعالى يقول فاتقوا الله ما استطعتم هناك واجبات عينيه على كل مسلم لابد ان يتعلم ما يصح به عبادته الواجبة هناك عبادات وجبات عينية كالصلاة كالصيام كغير ذلك من العبادات المعروفة يأتم المسلم تضيعها نحن إذا كانت طاقتنا وقدرتنا في بعض الظروف وتحت بعض الظروف تصل الأمة لحالة من الضعف لا تستطيع حتى أن تدافع عن نفسها في بعض المواقع كيف يعني نقول كيف كيف يعني يعني لن تقول الله تبارك وتعالى فاتقوا الله ما استطعتم من تقوى الله ان نقيم الصلاه ونؤتي الزكاه ان نتعلم ديننا ونفعل كل هذه الامور. والله والنبي عليه الصلاه والسلام يقول اذا امرتكم بامر فاتوا منه ما استطعتم. فاتوا منه ما استطعتم، اذا الانسان مطالب ان يتقي الله ما استطاع باتيان الواجبات وتجنب يعني المحرمات. لماذا لا نتذكر الاولويات في الاشتغال بقضايا الامه الاسلاميه الا حينما نتكلم عن الامور الشرعيه التي ينبغي ان نعطيها اهميه خاصه. مثلا إذا دعونا الناس إلى تعلم العقيدة، تعلم الفقه، تعلم وهذه الأمور الشرعية يقولون أن الأمة في خطر، المسلمين يذبحون، الغرب والشرق يتحدوا علينا. نعم، لكنكم ألستم ألستم إذا كنتم طلبة، ألستم تذهبون إلى الجامعة تدرسون العلوم الدنيوية وتتكسبون أرزاقكم و يعني جدولكم اليومي يمشي بطريقة يعني رتيبة وطريقة طبيعية بحيث ولا تتذكرون حينئذ مآتي المسلمين ومذابح المسلمين، نحن لا ندعوكم الى ذلك بان تتركوا هذا، لكن نقول ان يعني هذه الاشياء ينبغي الا نحقرها، الرسول عليه الصلاه والسلام يقول يا عائشه اياك ومحقرات الاعمال فان لهن من الله طالبه. وانا رضي الله تعالى عنه يقول يعني انكم لتعملون اعمالا هي ادق في اعينكم من الشعر، ان كنا لنعدها على عهد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من الموبقات، من الموبقات. نعم فالحقيقة نجد إهمالا كاملا لبعض الشعائر الإسلامية بعض أحكام الهدي الظاهر الاقتداء بالنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ونسمع كثيرا من الاعتراضات على من يوضح للناس شيئا من هذه الأمور أذكر هنا في الحقيقة كلمة قالها أحد الشيوخ الأفاضل من اليمن لما انتقضوا بعض الناس نفس هذا الانتقاد قال أنتم تتكلمون في يعني الحجاب تغطية المرأة تتكلمون في هذه الأمور فاللحية وغير ذلك من الأحكام الإسلامية واخوانكم في افغانستان يذبحون ايام الحرب في افغانستان. آه الاخ الفضل اجابه قال هب اننا حلقنا لحانا وعرينا نساءنا. ماذا يستفيد من ذلك اخواننا الافغان؟ ما يستفيدون شيئا. اي نعم. تفضل. Among the matters which we are critical with his tahrir is that we know that through Islamic history the study of different sects and groups, even the deviant groups, that there is no difference between all the different sects which have attributed themselves to Islam among the deviant groups and of course the people of the truth and the Sunnah al-Jama'ah that Tawheed is the source and the root and the foundation of the religion and that understanding Tawheed and teaching the correct beliefs and uh, doctrines of the Islamic religion is the most important matter except due to the, uh, when the appearance of the Hizb al-Tahrir have come they have completely forgotten this and they have therefore uniquely Uh, separate themselves even from all the classical sects of deviation. By them saying that the most important matter is that of leadership of the Islamic world and of uh, government or uh, ruling. Uh, thereby they have resembled the Shia. Indeed they have become more extreme in the Shia concerning this issue. And as a result they consider, they often argue with those people who adhere to the Salafi methodology or the Salafi uh, da'wah that you deal with insignificant matters and things which are not that important. And as a result, we must deal with these important matters because the Muslims are being slaughtered throughout the world and because uh, the plots of the disbelievers come day, and, day in and day out and so forth and so on. Our response to them is, have you not listened or have you not heard the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says, the meaning of which might be translated, O oh, you who believe, enter into a sin completely, in totality? What does this verse mean? 
And this is, of course, an ayah, not a hadith ahad, which they often try to use to reject certain beliefs. This is a verse from Allah's book. Enter into a sin completely. The scholars have said means enter into Islam, all its branches of faith, and adhere to all its regulations and its principles to its fullest. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, O you who believe, enter into Islam, meaning all the principles of faith and all the regulations of the Islamic religion completely, and follow not the footsteps of Satan. So therefore, what they consider to be insignificant matters are among the most important of matters. Is not prayer a requirement which is upon every single Muslim that he must pray five times a day? Is not prayer, as the Prophet Sallallahu described, the pillar, or as Irma said, the pillar of the Islamic religion? Do we not have to pray whether we have an Islamic state or not have an Islamic state? These are all issues which they fail to address uh, properly. For subhanAllah, if the Muslims are too weak to defend themselves, and the Muslims, due to their sins, are being slaughtered throughout East and West. Does that mean we must be neglectful of our duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in prayer and other acts of worship? We should remember the verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used to address this in the Quran, which we might translate as, O you who believe, fear Allah as much as you can. And the Prophet sallallahu saying something in the same import. If I command you with something, if I order you with something, try to apply it as much as you can. So therefore, when we say to the people we must teach aqidah, we must teach fiqh and the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly, they then come up and they say, oh, this is not the time for it. Do you not see how the Muslims are being slaughtered? Do you not see the plots of the disbelievers? But when it comes for their time to go to school and deal in their dunya affairs, their mundane affairs, like going to their university classes or going to work so they can uh, get their sustenance and so forth, they do not say we must deal with these plots of the disbelievers. We must, uh, the Muslims are being slaughtered throughout the world and therefore we must forsake uh, going to school and we must forsake uh, working and so forth in order to deal with these issues. They only bring this argument up when it comes time to learn the Islamic religion and when it comes time to learn how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how Satan has befooled them. And uh, we should remember that the statement of Anas, radiallahu anhu, he said, by Allah, you do things now which you consider in your eyes insignificant as a hair strand. But during the, the age of the Prophet Wasallam, we used to consider that these matters would lead to a person's destruction. And like such we find how the people have unfortunately turned their Islamic religion upside down and have considered the most important matters to be insignificant and consider matters which lead to people's destruction as something also insignificant. And then the Shaykh mentioned a statement of one of the scholars from Yemen who one time some people were arguing with him and said you, by you talking about the hijab that a woman, Muslim woman should cover herself properly or about the beard that a Muslim man must grow his beard how can you be discussing these issues while the people in Afghanistan are being slaughtered and this was of course early when the communists the Russians had invaded Afghanistan so the sheikh replied to them imagine now if we were to shave our beard and we were to unclothe our women so they could walk around naked would that change anything in Afghanistan? Of course not. So therefore, just because we tell the people to adhere to Allah's religion, to adhere to the Prophet Sallallahu motto and his sunnah, that does not mean that because of the plots of the disbelievers, we must forsake, therefore, everything which Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has given us. Uh, it has been, I have been asked to, inshallah, uh, take charge of the just of the rest of the uh, justice. So inshallah, Shaykh Muhammad Sunayi will have another turn to continue his okay, talk later. Right. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyid al-anbiya wa al-mursili wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa tabi'in bi-ihsan ilayhum al-deen. Amma ba'd. First, I would like to point out something uh, that I feel is very important to point out, which is that uh, in, you know, in matters, in situations like this, when we deal with people that we differ in opinion with them, uh, there is always tendency in people to take these matters either uh, personally or to, you know, take this as a basis for animosity and hatred to other to other groups and other parties. And this is not the intention. The intention of the the whole intention of a uh, of Muslims in general should be and of people who are following the way of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba in particular is to educate people 
in Islam, on the true Islam, uh, without being affected by those who turn away from their way, uh, who do not accept their way. And to take this, you know, with, uh, with kindness and wisdom, and to hope that, inshallah, other people will be guided by this, to emphasize the, the matters of aqidah, the matters of which soften the hearts and so on, uh, and to not go too far into arguing with people who just like to argue for the sake of argument. Uh, but unfortunately, as you know, there are situations where some, you know, causes of uh, arise, some problems arise, which, which push us to stand to defend our brothers so that they can continue to spread the da'wah in the proper way and so that they can be educated and others can be educated as well. But this shouldn't be understood as being a trend or something that should be the rule. It is the exception to the rule. So we should understand this very well, inshallah. And remember that that is why, for example, I believe that uh, uh, Brother Abu Muntasir earlier today said that this is a uh, semi-private jamsa uh, uh, and that people who would like to come to it are welcome. But it's, it's not something, you know, that it's like, you know, a necessity which is not something to be pleased uh, that we are involved in it. It's something that we are forced to do it. Uh, so, inshallah, in continuing with this jalsa, we give, uh, inshallah, uh, uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Ismail a little rest, inshallah, while I'll ask one of the questions that I have here. And you can start bringing your questions. And I'm sure that the, the subject will be covered uh, equally well in, uh, by answering questions because I'm sure the questions will center about three or four major issues that will be easier to cover by this question and answer thing rather than by, you know, uh, continued talk. And inshallah, Sheikh uh, uh, Abul Faraj will have the chance, inshallah, to, uh, to cover whatever areas of his talk uh, he, he still has to cover. Uh, I have a question here which says, uh, many people uh, from Hizb Tahrir reject matters that we tell them in Aqidah, saying that this, uh, uh, this comes through Hadith Ahad. How do we respond to this? في سؤال هنا أنه كثير من الناس كثير كثير من حزب التحرير يرفضون القضايا التي نخاطبهم بها متذرعين بأن هذا أمر في العقيدة والعقيدة لا تثبت إلا لا تثبت بحديث الآحاد كيف نجيب على هذا The question is directed to Sheikh Ayah Halabi إن شاء الله and please try to to make it brief إن شاء الله so that we can cover other parts of the of the subject. يعني رجال اختصار في الإجابة إن شاء الله. Impossible. قد في عندي خمس نقاط هذه مقدمة. إن شاء الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد. يطلبون مني الاختصار وأنا سأختصر في المقدمة وأما الجواب فنؤجل إلى سؤال آخر النقطة الأولى التي سأذكرها هي قضية الجهل الجهل وأثره في تعميق الخلاف بين الأمة هذه في الحقيقة قضية القضايا فكيف إذا أضيف إلى هذا الجهل التعصب الحزبي والحجر الفكري فحينئذ يكون الجهل جهالات كما الظلم ظلمات لذلك لا يكون طالب العلم طالب علم بمجرد الدعاوى وأن يقول أنا صاحب فكر وصاحب ثقافة وصاحب دراسة وصاحب نظر وإنما لا يكون هذا إلا بالمعرفة الحقيقية لعلم كتاب الله وعلم سنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم النقطة الثانية هي نقيض النقطة الأولى بمعنى أن الاختصاص العلمي أمر 
مهم جدا في وحدة الأمة وهذا أمر أضيق دائرة من دائرة العلم بعمومه فنحن نطلب من المسلمين أن يكونوا طلبة علم ولكن نطلب من طلاب العلم أن يكونوا متخصصين في بعض العلوم لأن تخصصهم له فائدتان الفائدة الأولى منعكسة عليهم وراجعة إليهم بمعنى أنهم يستوعبون ويتوسعون في فهم هذا الأمر الذي تخصصوا فيه والفائدة الثانية راجعة إلى الناس بعمومهم حيث يسألون أهل الاختصاص فيأخذون الجواب الشافي والكافي ومن مثال ذلك ما قد يصيب بعض الناس فقد يتألم الرجل أو واحد منا في أسنانه فلا يذهب إلى طبيب الأسنان وإنما يذهب إلى طبيب الأمراض الصدرية هذا خطأ لابد أن تذهب عند أهل الاختصاص وكذلك في العلم الشرعي إذا جاءت كمسألة حديثية لا يجوز أن تذهب وتسأل عنها إنسانا نحويا أو لغويا إذا جاءت كمسألة لغوية لا يجوز, لا يجوز أن تسأل عنها إنسانا أو أصوليا أو فقيها وهكذا في أصول الفقه لا تسأل المحدثين وفي الحديث لا تسأل أصوليين لذلك رحم الله من قال من تكلم في غير فنه أتى بالعجائب النقطة الثالثة وهي تبين فضل الإنصاف والرجوع إلى الحق وقبول الصواب فكثير من الناس لأنهم نشأوا على أمر وشبوا عليه بل شابوا عليه تراهم يتعصبون له فلا يرجعون إلى خلافه إن ظهر لهم الحق والصواب وهذا في الحقيقة أمر يخالف شرع الله ويخالف نهج دين الله جل وعلا فنذكر إخواننا وأنفسنا قبل ذلك كله بفضل الإنصاف ورفض كل أسباب الخصومة والاعتساف برد الحق وإنما بقبوله والاستجابة إليه النقطة الرابعة هي نقطة الاصطلاحات كثير من الناس يصطلحون اصطلاحات فيعيشون ضمن دائرتها ولا يستطيعون الخروج عنها ويحاكمون الناس حولها وهذا خطأ الاصطلاح لا يحكم الشرع وإنما الشرع هو الذي يحكم الاصطلاح لذلك لا يجوز الخلط في هذه القضية المهمة فبعض الناس عندما نتكلم مثلا في خبر الأحاد يظنون أننا نرفض الاصطلاح وهذا في الحقيقة نحن لا نرفض الاصطلاح ولكن نرفض ثمرة الاصطلاح التي تنشأ أو نشأت من هؤلاء لماذا؟ لأن ثمرة الاصطلاح نتجت عن تفريق في السنن ولكن لو قلنا الحديث قسمان من حيث الورود قسم أحاد وقسم متواتر وهكذا فقط مع مع اعتقادنا وجزمنا بأن كل ما ورد في السنة وصح عن النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام فهو يقال به ويعتقد ويصدق لكان الأمر واسعا فلا غضاضة في هذا الاصطلاح لذلك قال أهل العلم لا مشاحة في الاصطلاح ولكن لابد من إضافة وهي أنه لا مشاحة في الاصطلاح إن لم يؤثر هذا الاصطلاح سلبيا على أهل الاصطلاح كمثل أضرب مثالا على ذلك أختم به هذه التوطئة كمثل قولنا في أو كمثل قول السافي السفهاء او السفهاء والتافهين والبعيدين عن دين رب العالمين في تسميتهم الخمر بغير اسمها، فالرسول عليه الصلاه والسلام قال يسمونها بغير اسمها، اذا هم وضعوا عليها اصطلاحا جديدا واسما اخر، فهل هذا الاصطلاح غير حقيقه الحكم؟ لا، فعندما يسمي بعض الناس الخمور بالمشروبات الروحيه. وكلمة المشروبات الروحية أولى أن يسمى بها الماء لأن الماء قال الله فيه وجعلنا من الماء كل شيء حي ولكن لا يجوز اليوم أن نسمي الماء بأنه مشروبات روحية لأن اصطلاح المشروبات الروحية أصبح خاصا بالخمر وهكذا فهؤلاء عندما يقسمون بين الخبر الأحاد والمتواتر فقط تقسيما نظريا علميا لتقريب 
هذه المصطلحات والمفاهيم على طلاب العلم فهذا لا مانع منه ولكن عندما نراهم يتوسعون في ذلك ويريدون الثمرة الفجة التي تنتج عن تقسيمهم هذا فحينئذ يبدأ الخطأ بالتراكم وبالتعاظم فحينئذ يبدأ الرد عليهم وبيان خطأهم من وجوه كثيرة نختصر على شيء منها في ما بعد والله تعالى أعلم So the Sheikh said, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a brief introduction. I'm not going to really answer the question because this introduction is quite essential as it sort of uh, lays the foundation to my response. And I'll leave the response a little bit later on. The first thing we should understand that the danger are the effect of ignorance in causing the Muslims to divide further. That ignorance is one of the main reasons and one of the root causes for the division and the splitting of the Muslims into different groups. And when this ignorance is added to it, uh, uh, party uh, loyalty and partisanship and blind fanaticism to a certain party or a certain group, then that ignorance is compounded and the differences become greater. And that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that a person, for a person to claim of himself as a seeker of the truth or a student of knowledge, this in itself is a mere claim. And that true knowledge can only be found when a person really attempts to stu- study the Book of Allah and understand the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as required. And that just merely claiming that a person claiming about himself, describing himself that he's a seeker of the truth or that he's a seeker of the knowledge or student of knowledge, that in itself is a mere claim and is not worthy, uh, not worth anything so long as there's not true knowledge uh, found in that person uh, or to be found in that person, that knowledge being in the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The second point is, is that, in this introduction, is that we call the Muslims to have specialties in their knowledge. We don't just want the Muslims just to have a general uh, knowledge. Indeed, we call the Muslims in a whole, we say to the Muslims as a whole, we want of you to be seekers of the truth, students of knowledge. And then we ask those who actually achieve knowledge that they then go forth and specialize in that knowledge. And by their specialization in a certain branch of knowledge, two benefits appear. The first benefit is that they get a very deep uh, rooted uh, hold of one branch of knowledge and that's a personal benefit they gain. And the second benefit they gain is that they are then able to convey that deep knowledge in a certain specialty to the Ummah, to the Muslims as a whole. And it's very important then therefore that one seeks concerning any issue to ask the specialist in that field. And the Shaykh gave an example, a similitude. He said that if a person had a toothache, would it make sense for him to go to a doctor who specializes in internal medicine? Of course not. But it would be for him to then go to a doctor who has specialized in the ailments and the ills of uh, the mouth, the teeth, like a dentist. And for him to go to a doctor in internal medicine, that in itself would be uh, obviously foolish. In the same reason that for a person, when they're discussing the subject of hadith al-ahad, For him then to go to a linguist or a scholar of grammar, Arabic grammar, or a scholar of fiqh and ask him a a point concerning the subject of hadith, that is also incorrect, just like the person who instead of seeking a dentist for his toothache, went to a doctor in internal medicine. But rather for him it is to go to that person who is a specialist and a scholar in hadith. And this is in all the uh, fields of uh, Islamic uh, Sharia uh, studies. And that is why the scholars have a, a saying, they said, whoever speaks concerning outside of his subject, he comes with uh, matters which are unbelievable. Meaning he says so many crazy things, it cannot be imagined that a person who would be knowledgeable could say such a thing. And that's because he spoke about that which he has no special, uh, specialization in. Uh, the third matter is, we must also understand that sometimes people uh, set up for themselves certain conventions. They have certain terms, certain slogans, certain... Uh, words by which they adhere to. And they've made up these conventions for themselves. Unfortunately, they then are bound by those con- conventions and those slogans in their terms, and they cannot step outside of it. And the problem becomes great because not only are they erased upon these conventions and terms and these slogans and labels, but what happens is they become old upon this. And they're therefore, when the truth is presented for them, they, they find themselves difficult to step out of the falsehood which they are in because they have bound themselves to these conventions. An example is 
when they have this convention of khabar al-ahad or the hadith, the ahad hadith, many of the people misunderstand that we are arguing with them concerning the actual existence or the permissibility of describing hadith as ahad hadith. And that is not where the discussion lies. But rather the root of the discussion lies in what they say is the result or what is the logical conclusion of dividing the hadith into two parts, being mutawatir and ahad hadith. That this necessitates us to reject a whole portion of the sunnah. This is where the conflict or the discussion uh, exists. As far as just describing the sunnah as saying the sunnah has reached us in two manners, two general manners. That which is mutawatir in its mode of transmission and that which is ahad in its mode of transmission. We submit to this as a, a means of just uh, bringing forth a certain understanding to the people, to the student of knowledge. But what they say is the logical conclusion of this division, that this division necessitates that we reject certain essential beliefs because they are rooted in ahad hadith, that is what we reject. And we say that your conclusion, which you have come out of from this convention, that's where the error is. But they imagine we, they're thinking we're just arguing with them concerning does this convention actually exist or not. The argument, and this is very important to understand, is not concerning the use of the convention, but what they assume is the logical conclusion used, uh, or that results from the use of that convention. And the Shaykh gave an example. We know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which might be translated concerning a certain people of this ummah, a foolish people, who will call Khamar, a uh, wine, by a name other than its name. By hoping by doing such a thing that people would then, of course, the meaning is that they would drink it or so forth, they would not find any fault in it. By them changing the name of Khamar and calling it by another name, does that change the reality that Khamar is forbidden in the religion of Allah? Of course not. And therefore we must understand the rule that the conventions in themselves, labels and terms people uh, invent themselves, do not change anything from the realities of the Sharia. But rather we must use the realities of the Sharia to judge concerning the uh, authenticity and the correctness of that convention and what they or people claim to result as a natural conclusion and a natural uh, a progression from that uh, convention. And, uh, and that's what the Shaykh said in brief, and this is just an introduction which you will return to a greater uh, detail of thereafter. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first to uh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ismail. Uh, 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 Muhammad Ismail. Uh, تطلبون منا أن نبدأ بما بدأ به الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو قد صرف ثلاث عشرة سنة في مكة يعلم الناس العقيدة وهذا يعني من الهدر لأوقات المسلمين وجهودهم حيث أن الإسلام قد وطد يعني والناس يعرفون العقيدة الآن وهي منتشرة بينهم فلذلك يجب أن نصرف إمامنا إلى ما هو أهم هذا من جهة, من جهة أخرى فإن تغيير الأمة ليس على الله بعزيز يعني أن يغير الأمة بالشكل الذي يعني بإقامة الخلافة ثم بعد ذلك تتغير مشاكل المسلمين الأخرى فلماذا تشككون في قدرة الله تعالى وفي نيات إخوانكم وبعد ذلك إن شاء الله سؤال, سؤال الشيخ علي الحلبي قولكم أنه هنالك يعني أهل اختصاص في الدين فهل هذا معناه أن الإسلام يصبح حكرا على فئة محدودة من الناس ولا ولا مجال لغيرهم أن يتدخلوا فيه وفي فهمه وفي نقله للناس uh, I'll translate the question to Sheikh uh, uh, Muhammad Ismail uh, It says uh, you are asking us to start uh, to follow the way of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم by establishing the aqidah and then going to the other matters but the Aqidah is known to people now and has been established and we should spend our time in establishing some other important matters that people need, including for example uh, establishing the Khilafah and so on. So why should we waste time, our time on something that the Prophet ﷺ has established long time ago? And then, uh, on the other hand, changing the Ummah is not something which is very great to Allah Azza wa Jal, whether it starts from the top or from the bottom. So why are you throwing doubt about the power of Allah Azza wa and the intentions of your brothers? To save time, I'll try to use my poor English. 
Uh, no doubt, I you know I wonder for this uh, question, you know, because actually uh, the answer was to come in the in, you know in the rest of my speech, but I didn't complete it yet. Uh, anyhow, you know the meaning of the, of the jama'ah. You know there are two kinds of jama'ah jama in Islam: the jama'ah al amma which is the caliphate, and jama'ah al khassa particular you know, a society or a group. Uh, there are so many differences in, uh, in the judgments of both. I will concentrate only, concentrate only in one of these, you know, uh, differences. I mean, you know, uh, one of these differences, the, the, you know, the, um, the state of caliphate, you know, the, the, you know uh, yani, um, the members, you know, are of, of every kind. The pious, the criminal, the thief, the you know uh, the good man the bad man you know all this mixture you know is present it are all members in this you know uh, in this uh, caliphate but to uh, achieve a certain goal you know you have to select you know a particular you know features on the members uh, uh, when we concentrate uh, in the uh, um, when we concentrate in, in the beginning of da'wah, or building up the da'wah, or the uh, groups who will make the da'wah, we, uh, it is our right to choose or to concentrate on uh, certain meanings and give them more importance than others. For example, the, uh, if we want a man, you know, to, uh, you know, to yani, uh, watch the money of the zakat, for example, we will look for you know, certain characters or manners in this man, you know, uh, suitable for this function. I mean, he should be honest, he should be so and so, to keep this money. You know, when we are making a uh, change in the uh, ideas of people, we have to, you know, to select uh, a knowledgeable, uh, knowledgeable man uh, who is suitable for this function. Uh, then it is the right of the jama'at of da'wah to select a per persons or members of certain Characters suitable for this task, you see. Uh, uh, and you know, actually, uh, the, the brothers say that uh, we, we waste time when we uh, talk about aqidah, you know, because people is, are all right, you know, have tawhid and so on. Uh, you know, uh, why do you say so? Do you judge all the ummah according and through these groups of brothers present in the? You know, in the conferences or in the mosques, do you judge all the ummah by this, you know, minor groups everywhere? Judge the ummah, you know, uh, yani, uh, as a whole. You know, you will find a Muslim who believes that the Christian and Jewish is the mother, is the brother of, of, uh, of a Muslim. And there is no, dif no difference between religions. You know, you will find some Muslims who say Jesus was crucified. You know, he, he had n he never, you know, uh, uh, yani learned that, uh, that this is a false from the Qur'an, you see. You will find so many uh, bad things about, you know, w that, that may nullify the belief of so many uh, persons who claim that they, they are Muslims. Look at the grave worshippers in so many of our countries. Those who frustrate behind, you know, in front of the, uh, of the tomb. Those who go around it like the Kaaba. You know, those who do so and so, you know. Also, one of the aspects of uh, anti-Tawheed, you know, features are uh, giving the rulers the, the right to uh, make the haram halal and, you know, and vice versa. You see, this is also a sort of shirk. This is a part of our uh, belief to clarify. You see, we do, we do not, you know, neglect this subject, but we criticize those who... Uh, give all, you know, importance for this subject only. And this is what I can say now, inshallah, I hope afterwards we'll give details. We never judge the intentions of any man, brother. He says we, uh, what, is, what is the evidence for that accusation? SubhanAllah. No, that, that you do not, uh, you, you say that uh, the thing cannot be started from the top or that you cannot uh, change from the top. You uh, and that Allah act, can, act can do it by saying kum for example or something like that. No, but sh we should respect, you know, the causes. We should respect the, the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything. 
Yes. Okay, inshallah, the, the, I'll direct the question now to Sheikh Al Halavi. It says, uh, why do you want to make uh, Islam like a monopoly for only one group of people, uh, as you said in, your, in, the, in the introduction to your answer, that uh, you know, Islam is only for the specialists like, the, uh, like dentists specialized in uh, working on teeth and so on. So, uh, yani, if you would answer this question and also continue with your answer to the other question, inshallah, is that one? ما شاء الله أقول جوابا على هذا السؤال يقول السائل هل تريدون أن تحكروا أو تحكروا الإسلام على فئة معينة أو محددة أقول لا ولكن نريد شيئا آخر نريد أن لا نجعل الإسلام أو العلم بالإسلام مضغطا في كل لسان يتكلم بها من يدري ومن لا يدري فأهل الاختصاصات المادية يحترم بعضهم بعضا فما بال المسلمين لا يحترم بعضهم بعضا في اختصاصاتهم العلمية نحن لا نريد من عامي لا يعرف الفرق بين الفعل والفاعل والمفعول به أن يتكلم في أحكام الإسلام وفي تفسير القرآن وفي سنة النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام ولكن نريده أن يتعلم حتى يعلم فإذا علم كان الإسلام تاجا عظيما يزين به هامته ويدعو إلى الله تبارك وتعالى فيه على بصيرة أما أن نقول أن نحكر الإسلام على فئة معينة فنقول في كل عصر منذ العصر الأول كان العلم بالإسلام على فئة معينة فالرسول عليه الصلاة والسلام عندما أرسل معاذا وأبا موسى وعليا وغيرهم لم يرسل عامة الصحابة وإنما أرسل أفزاد الصحابة وعلماءهم وأعيانهم هذا الذي نريده ولا نريد إساءة الفهم في قضية بينة كالشمس في رابعة النهار As for its response that Islam, we're trying to make Islam therefore a monopoly, which only certain people have and they're the only ones who can talk about it, that of course is not the intention. But rather what we're saying is that knowledge of Islam cannot be reduced to something where every single person talks about Islam in any manner he wants without having any knowledge of this religion. That's what we're prohibiting. And for instance, you notice very clearly that the, the people in this world who specialize in worldly uh, uh, branches of knowledge, like medicine, uh, chemistry, biology, computers, or whatever, each of them mutually respect the scholars of other fields. And they do not try to talk about that which they do not know. Why is it now that the Muslims themselves cannot respect the scholars who know the religion of Islam and try to delve into a field which they do not know? <coughs> However, though, in their mundane affairs, they would prevent themselves from talking about that which they do not specialize in. So, for instance, what our fear is, our fear is that the general Muslim, who has no knowledge of, for instance, uh, the basics of grammar, like who is, what is the subject, and what is the object, and what is the verb in a sentence, in a, in a verse of the Qur'an, or in a statement of the Prophet ﷺ, then comes and starts to expound upon the meaning of these verses and the meanings of these narrations. Rather, what we want and what we uh, require of this person, this general Muslim, of this average Muslim, that he goes out and seeks to learn the religion. And then if he learns the religion properly, he can then go out and teach and call people to Islam on sure sightedness and on true knowledge. And this is why look at how the Prophet ﷺ dealt in matters of da'wah. We find that the Prophet ﷺ, when he used to send his companions to various uh, nations to teach them, like when he sent Ma'az ibn Jabal, and when he sent Ali to the country of Yemen, he didn't just send any of the average uh, Muslims, any of the average companions, but rather he sent their leaders, their scholars, and the notable uh, imams, uh, the notable scholars amongst the Prophet's uh, companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
I have some questions here from uh, some brothers who uh, seem to be uh, not very familiar with Hizbut Tahrir and they would like some background about this party that probably they have heard for it, about it just a little bit. So the question, one of the questions say, uh, could the panel shed some light on background of Hizbut Tahrir, one established leaders, uh, funding, are they the extension of uh, Hizb al-Tahrir in Palestine, and so on. And uh, another question says, can you briefly explain the foundation of Hizb al-Tahrir, and can you assure uh, as that their founder said that no prayers, salat, and other uh, ibadat uh, under kafirs is being established, and uh, the third question also related says, uh, Has Tahrir uh, seems to refer to many scholars in their debates and arguments. Do they have their own scholars and what are their credentials? Uh, تقول إنه رجاء يعني أعطانا بعض الخلفية عن حزب التحرير يعني من هم ومن هم علماءهم ورجالاتهم وهل هل هو حقيق صحيح أن مؤسسهم يقول أنه لا لا يمكن إقامة العبادات في خلاف ال في غياب الخلافة ف فلا يمكن يعني نبذة عن حزب التحرير ذاك الله خير لمن يجهل ذلك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, I think it was founded in the beginning of the fifties about you know uh, 1951 uh, the beginning of the activity of Sheikh Taqiyuddin Nabhani but uh, few I think uh, in 1378 since about uh, 35 years ago and I'm talking about Arabic okay no, no problem I, I, I try to save time only جزاك الله خير ماشي بارك الله فيك هو هيك نعم لا ما في مشكلة يعني ما أعلم أن الحزب تكون أو تأسس في بدايات الخمسينيات وأسس الشيخ تقي الدين النبهاني وهو يعتبر المنظر الأول والأساسي بالنسبة لحزب التحرير أما مسألة أن بيقول لي تاني سؤال تعالى من هم علماؤهم أيضا يعني وما مؤهلاتهم وهل فعلا أنه يعني لا تق يقول أنه لا تقام العبادات إلا في وجود الخلافة نعم أما علماؤهم في ال ال كما ذكرنا القطب الأساسي الذي يدور حول فكر الحزب هو أفكار الشيخ تقي الدين هلالي فالنبهاني تقي الدين النبهاني نعم هم لا يرفضون طبعا اهتمام بال بال بالعبادات لكن كما الأخوة لا يلاح لا يلاحظون إن التركيز المركز على أن هذه الأشياء لا تعطى الاهتمام الواجب وذكرنا بعض النقول التي تبين أن مثل هذه الأشياء ينبغي ألا يوجه جهد كبير إليها في ظل أو في غياب الدولة الإسلامية لكن ما نقول مثلا هم لا يصلون كلهم وإن كان بعضهم لا يصلي ولا يهتم بالصلاة لكن ما نقول أنهم يتبنون هجر الصلاة أو العبادات لكن نقول لا يعطونها الاهتمام الواجب ولا يقبها الله أعلم as far as the uh, the founding of this party, well, it seems that it first was founded in the early 50s under the guidance and the direction of a certain scholar called Taqiyyadin and Nebahani. And basically, it was his ideas and his program, his uh, uh, beliefs, which formed the foundation and still remain the foundation of Hizb al-Tahrir. Uh, they really do not have any other, other teachers who have uh, reached the, uh, or intellectuals amongst them, who have reached the level of uh, Sheikh Taqiyyadeen, but rather it's the ideas of Taqiyyadeen and Nabahani which remain the foundation uh, of, his, uh, of, of the group's uh, beliefs. And you might, I might add, which even though the Sheikh uh, did not mention, that some of their works, for instance, just for the sake of uh, clarity, one of them is called uh, Nizam al-Islam, one of their famous uh, works, uh, The System of Islam, and I've seen a translation of this in England, uh, in English, which I received about a week ago in the United States, I found it in uh, New York City, and also uh, another one of their works is called uh, Dosia. Dosia, 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 
Uh, this work is also a very uh, critical work, work in which they base a lot of their beliefs in. However, though I'm not aware if this work has been translated into English or not. I, I don't know. But as far as the first work, uh, Nidham of Islam, the system of Islam, uh, this work is, uh, has been translated to English, and I have a copy which I received about a week ago in New York. Uh, the other point is that, as far as the statement that is it true that Sheikh Taqiyyid al uh said that we cannot establish any act of worship in the absence of the Khilafah, uh, the Islamic State. Uh, the question here is that whether he said this or not is not really in itself a consequence unless we are to be certain of if he said it or not. But what we do find among his followers is that Without doubt, there is a lack of stress and a lack of importance concerning the different acts of worship. And we do find that even sometimes some of the, their followers go to the extreme and actually apply what has been now attributed to Sheikh Taqiyyin, whether he actually said it or not, uh, and they do not even pray, for instance. But you cannot say this is a general description of all of them, but rather they do have a lack of regard for the various acts of worship, and some of them do take it to the extreme, uh, saying that since it was not an Islamic state, Therefore, it's not required for us to pray or uh, do the other acts of worship. And this is unfortunate that this uh, uh, idea, this belief is prevalent among their people. So, inshallah, now we, uh, we go back to Sheikh uh, Ayah Halabi and, uh, and ask him to give us the rest of his answer in regards to uh, Hadith Al-Ahad, what it means and why can we or we cannot establish our Aqidah based on it. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه مسألة خبر الأحاد وحجيته في العقيدة مسألة كما يقولون طال حولها الجدل وهو في الحقيقة جدل في كثير من صوره غير قائم على العلم وإنما يقوم على التقليد وعلى الظن وعلى عدم العلم الحقيقي بأطراف هذه المسألة وشعبها وعندنا ولله الحمد في هذه القضية من الحجج ما تسكت كل منصف أقول ما تسكت كل منصف أما غير المنصف فوالله لو أتيته بألف حجة وحجة ما استمع ولا استجاب لذلك اقول اختصارا للقول فقط ساذكر ثلاث حجج من بين سبع حجج ذكرتها وقيدتها امامي لن اذكر الا ثلاث حجج وتكفي منها واحده تكفي منها واحده ولكن ساذكر الثلاثه ثم اختم بذكر مثال تطبيقي لا يسع المنكرين لحجية خبر الأحاد في العقيدة إلا أن يقعوا به ويقولوا بمقتضاه فإذا وقعوا به وقالوا بمقتضاه كان ذلك سبيلا يهدمون به مبدأ فكرتهم وقاعدة تفكيرهم قبل ذلك كل أيها الإخوة لابد أن نشير إلى إلى أصل المسألة ما هو معنى الآحاد والمتواتر والظن إلى آخر هذه الأمور التي يقولونها يقولون العقيدة لا تبنى على الظن وما يدفع الظن مما ورد في السنة هو ما رواه الجمع الكثير هو ما رواه الجمع الكثير وليس ما رواه الآحاد من الصحابة أو من الرواء الواحد والاثنان والثلاثة إلى آخر هذه الأعداد القريبة فبالتالي هؤلاء سهل دخول الخطأ عليهم وبالتالي هذا مبنى من مباني الظن والأصل ألا يعتمد على الظن وإنما يعتمد على القطع هذه أصل فلسفتهم في هذه القضية لذلك تبعوا هذا التفريق بأمر فقالوا العقيدة لا تثبت إلا بدليل قطعي الثبوت قطعي الدلالة معنى قطعي الثبوت إما أن يكون قرآنا أو حديثا متواترا رواه الجمع الكثير الغفير عن الجمع الكثير الغفير 
وظني وان يكون قطعي الدلاله اي لا يحتمل معناه الا وجها واحدا لا يحتمل معناه الا وجها واحدا Now, going into the subject about the uh, Ahadith al-Ahad, and do the Ahadith al-Ahad in themselves uh, establish a proof for affirming matters of belief, matters of doctrine, matters of creed? We should understand that this issue in itself has, is a, a historical argument to it, and that it's not just something which has just arrived now due to the presence of Hizb al but rather this argument in itself has its basis and its roots uh, throughout history. And unfortunately, in, if you look in the books and the arguments of the scholars concerning the subject, we find that many aspects of the subject are, have not been dealt with uh, based on firm knowledge. But a lot of it has been based upon uh, conjecture and speculation and not really uh, uh, looking to the evidences with clear uh, sure-sightedness and trying to clearly uh, define the issue in a way which allows no conjecture or no room for misunderstanding. And we must bring to mind that the proofs which show that the Hadith al-Ahad is an uh, evidence upon which you may establish matters of belief are so numerous. In fact, they are more numerous than you can actually count and enumerate. However, though, we must always realize that if a person is seeking the truth, even if you brought him one or two proofs, he would submit to it. But the person who does not want to follow the truth and wants to adhere to his whims and his desires and his fancies or his party loyalty and his party... Uh, a, a group which he holds on to, he will reject the truth even if you bring him a thousand and one proofs. The Sheikh says that I have uh, listed in front of me seven specific proofs, which I will, any one of them in itself is sufficient, but I will just choose three uh, to uh, uh, mention in this uh, sitting, and I will then follow that with a practical example, which shows that the Ahad Hadith do have a foundation and a basis in Aqidah. Uh, however, before we actually get into this, we must sort of uh, 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 recant the argument or uh, re-say uh, the argument which they have. Their argument really comes like this. They say that aqidah, matters of belief, has to be based upon certainties and cannot be based upon something which is conjectural or which the possibility of fault or error uh, lie in. But rather, any matter of belief must be based upon something which is uh, certain and has no doubt to it being affirmed in both its transmission and also in its meaning. And for instance, that's why they say that the Mutawatir Hadith, which is defined as that narration upon the Prophet Sallallahu which was related by so many people, uh, generation after generation, level after level in the chains of narration, that it's impossible for either a lie to have occurred in it or an error or a misunderstanding to have occurred for it. These are good to establish beliefs in. As far as those narrations which come from a single companion, or from a few narrators, we cannot establish a belief on it because there is a possibility that the person made a mistake, misheard, misunderstood, or he could himself be a liar. Uh, this is their argument. And therefore, they summarize it by saying that in matters of belief, we can only establish beliefs based on those unequivocal matters which are found unequivocal in the sense that we are certain that it's found and rooted in the Sharia and unequivocal in the sense that the meaning of it is well known. And that can only be found in that which is either found...